Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. The subject for today's video is probably the one that I get the most requests for and it's something that I've been wanting to cover for a while. So to anyone who's requested this video, here you go. This is the murder of Sylvia Likens. So there's a lot of different people involved in this story and as I was researching it I found it quite hard to follow who was who. There's two main families involved in this case, the Banishevskys and the Likens. Plus there's a lot of people from outside both those families. As a bit of a visual aid I'm going to tint the Banishevskys photos blue and the Likens family yellow. Anyone outside those families will be untinted. It's not crucial. If you're colorblind or you're just listening to the audio, you should still be able to follow what's going on. By 1965, Gertrude Banishevsky looked about 20 years older than her years. She had divorced twice, had seven children and had suffered six miscarriages. All of her past relationships had been abusive. Now, at the age of 36, she was left to raise her kids alone with no income. Destitute, chronically asthmatic and clinically depressed, Gertrude and her family descended into poverty. They lived together at 3850 East New York Street, Indianapolis. They had no stove and only enough beds for about half the people in the house. The family lived off a diet of mostly bread and crackers. Sometimes they would make soup on a hot plate, but the family had to take turns eating it because there were only three spoons between them. At this point, the household consisted of eight people. 36-year-old Gertrude and her children. Paula, 17 years old. Stephanie, 15. John Jr., 12. Marie, 11. Shirley, 10. James, 8, and 1-year-old Dennis. The Likens family were also quite poor. Lester and Betty had five children. The two oldest, 18-year-olds Daniel and Diana, were twins, as were the two youngest, 15-year-olds Benny and Jenny. In the middle was 16-year-old Sylvia. Diana was already married and starting a family of her own. Lester Likens and his two sons toured Indiana, selling confectionery from a stand at carnival shows. Betty had temporarily separated from Lester. She, along with Sylvia and Jenny, lived together in Indianapolis and would earn money from babysitting and doing odd jobs around town. They would also collect glass bottles from people's trash and trade them in for pennies. Jenny had contracted polio at a young age and as a result she had to wear a metal brace on one leg and walked with a limp. This made Sylvia very protective of Jenny. In July of 1965, Betty was arrested for shoplifting and thrown into county jail, effectively leaving Sylvia and Jenny alone to fend for themselves. Shortly afterwards, they met up with their school friend Paula Banishevsky and went back to her house to listen to pop records. Back at the house, Gertrude heard Jenny and Sylvia's plight and offered to let the girls stay the night. The next day, Lester Likens tracked down the girls at Gertrude's house. He told them that he and their mother had made up and when she got out of jail they were going to travel around the USA on the carnival circuit. He made a deal with Gertrude Banishevsky. She would look after Sylvia and Jenny at her house. In return he would send her $20 a week. It's a shame here that he didn't take some time to look around Gertrude's house before making the deal. Maybe if he'd seen the squalor and the poverty within, he might not have left his daughters in her care. The first week for Sylvia and Jenny weren't too bad. 
They enjoyed hanging out with the other children and singing along to Beatles records. Then, when their father failed to send the $20 payment on time, they received their first punishment. Gertrude flew into a rage when the money didn't arrive, screaming, I took care of you two bitches for nothing. She then dragged them into the bedroom. There she made them lie across her bed while she beat them over their bare buttocks with a heavy wooden paddle. The next week Sylvia received another paddle beating. She and Jenny had been collecting empty soda bottles and exchanging them for money. Then they used this money to buy candy. When the girls returned to the Banaszewski house with the candy, Gertrude accused them of stealing. Sylvia attempted to explain and received a beating for lying. A short time after that came the third punishment. Gertrude's children came to her to inform on Sylvia's behaviour. They had been to a church social and Sylvia had pigged out on a large amount of food. That evening as the family sat round the dinner table, Gertrude ordered that Sylvia's hot dog be passed around the table. As it passed each child, they heaped condiments and spices onto the hot dog, then forced Sylvia to eat it. It was so overloaded that Sylvia vomited. As a further punishment, she was then made to scoop up and eat her own vomit. Here we can see the beginning of the escalation. Within a few weeks, things had moved from spanking with a paddle to a bizarre form of humiliation in front of the family. It's also worth noting that this was the first time that Gertrude had involved the other children in Sylvia's abuse. This was a pattern that would continue in the following weeks. During these first few weeks, Lester and Betty Likens visited their daughters twice to check how Gertrude was treating them. Both times, neither girl mentioned the abuse. Presumably they'd been threatened with more beatings if they told. Sometime in early August, the intensity of the abuse increased severely. By now it was almost exclusively directed at Sylvia. Possibly this is because she was so protective of her sister Jenny, so she would step in and take a beating on her behalf. The sudden increase in abuse is thought to stem from a conversation Gertrude overheard where Sylvia mentioned that she'd once laid in bed with a boyfriend. They hadn't really done anything serious. Sylvia's autopsy would later prove that she died a virgin. Gertrude, though, assumed the worst and flew into a violent rage. She dragged Sylvia in front of the other children and told them that she was a prostitute. She said that Sylvia had gotten pregnant because she'd allowed a man to touch her privates. She then kicked her hard in the crotch. Over the coming weeks, Sylvia would receive many more such kicks to the privates. This happened so frequently that her autopsy showed that, as well as being a virgin, her vagina was horribly mutilated and the entrance was almost fused shut. It's been theorised that Gertrude saw her own failed potential in Sylvia. Gertrude, alone, destitute, with her looks withering away, probably felt quite resentful of the attractive and confident Sylvia. This bitterness may have been a motivating factor for the abuse. Personally, I think it has more to do with Paula, Gertrude's oldest daughter. By early August, Paula was heavily pregnant after a fling with a middle-aged man. It may have been that Sylvia acted as a sort of proxy, receiving the anger and abuse that Gertrude wanted to direct at Paula. Perhaps it was a way of absolving her daughter of her own sins by passing the blame onto Sylvia instead. 
Anyway, shortly after this attack, Sylvia retaliated by spreading a rumour at their school that Paula and her sister Stephanie were prostituting themselves. When Stephanie's boyfriend, Coy Hubbard, found out that Sylvia had started this rumour, he came to the house and gave her a beating. Gertrude witnessed this beating and, instead of putting a stop to it, she encouraged it to continue. From that point onwards, Coy Hubbard was encouraged to visit the house and practice his judo on Sylvia, throwing her against the wall or floor. Over time, Sylvia became a sort of plaything for Gertrude's children and other neighbourhood kids. They would come to the house just to beat her up or torment her in some other kind of way. Sometimes they would push her down the stairs for fun. Gertrude would tell kids that Sylvia had been spreading lies about them and then invite them round to the house to exact their revenge. She would also make Sylvia perform strip teases in front of the other children. Boys would pay five cents apiece to see Sylvia strip for them. On at least two occasions she was made to masturbate with an empty coke bottle in front of a crowd of neighbourhood children. On one occasion, Sylvia needed a sweatsuit for gym class. When Gertrude refused to buy her one, Sylvia resorted to stealing it instead. As punishment, a lit match was held over each of Sylvia's fingertips until the skin blistered. Burning seemed to be a favourite torture for the Banaszewskis. After the fingertip incident, any smokers in the house used Sylvia as a kind of human ashtray, extinguishing their cigarettes on her skin. The children would also torment her with lit matches and by throwing cups of scalding water over her. In fact, this was witnessed by a neighbour. Sometime in August, a middle-aged couple named Phyllis and Raymond Vermillion moved in next door to the Banishevskys. After seeing how many children Gertrude was taking care of, they considered hiring her to babysit their own kids. They decided to hold a barbecue party in their yard and invited the Banaszewskis to get to know them. At some point during the party, Phyllis noticed Sylvia had a black eye. Inquiring how it happened, Paula proudly announced that she had done it. Then, as if trying to impress the Vermillions, she fetched a cup of boiling water and threw it in Sylvia's face whilst Gertrude watched on approvingly. Needless to say, the Vermillions didn't employ her babysitting services, but neither did they report the incident to the authorities. A similar incident happened several weeks later when Phyllis Vermillion visited the Banaszewskis to borrow something. She saw Sylvia walking round in a dazed state with swollen lips and a black eye. Again, Paula announced that she had done it before picking up a leather belt and whipping Sylvia in the face. Once again, Phyllis failed to report the incident to anyone outside the family. At some point in early October, Sylvia wet the bed. This could have been a result of the constant beatings to her crotch and stomach making her incontinence, or perhaps she was so psychologically scarred that she was reverting to an infantile state. Either way, Gertrude decided that she was no longer fit to live with the rest of the family. She now had to live in the filthy basement with the family's dog. From here on out, the abuse somehow got even worse. She was no longer allowed out of the house to attend school. Most of the time, she was simply kept naked in the cellar. There was no toilet down there, meaning she had to defecate on the floor. There was also no bed, so she had to sleep in her own filth. Quite often, she was tied up in uncomfortable positions, like being tied by the wrists from the staircase so she could only reach the floor with her tiptoes. She was also subjected to prolonged starvation and dehydration. Sometimes she wouldn't be fed for days on end. 
When they did feed her, it was in some cruel or degrading way, such as forcing her to eat spoiled food out of the garbage can. Sometimes she would have to earn the right to eat by cleaning the basement first. Cleaning the basement involved eating the feces that had accumulated on the floor. They also made her collect her own urine in a container, then drink it. On one occasion they smeared the contents of a baby's diaper into her mouth. It was around this time that a local boy named Richard Hobbs started to hang out at the house. He would help out with their treatment of Sylvia. Hobbs was a mild-mannered honor student with no history of criminality or violence. After he started hanging out at the Banishevsky residence, his demeanor changed drastically. He loyally obeyed anything that Gertrude told him to do, eagerly participating in the abuse. It's been speculated that Gertrude was in a sexual relationship with this 14-year-old boy and that's why she was so easily able to manipulate him. On a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, Sylvia would be subjected to a particularly nasty treatment. According to Gertrude, she was an unclean girl, both physically and spiritually, and she needed to be cleansed. Gertrude, Paula and Richard would tie up Sylvia by the wrists and ankles, then drag her into the bathroom. The bath would be filled with scalding hot water and Sylvia would be dunked screaming into it. When they were done they would pull her out of the bath and scrub her blistered flesh with handfuls of salt. If at any time she passed out from the pain, Gertrude would bang Sylvia's head against the wall to revive her. There was actually an opportunity for rescue during this period. A few weeks before she had been locked in the basement, Sylvia encountered her older sister Diana in a local park and told her of the horrors occurring inside the house. At first Diana assumed she was exaggerating but later decided to visit the Banishevsky house to check for herself. This was around October the 1st, about five days before Sylvia was first thrown into the cellar. When Diana arrived at the house, Gertrude told her that she didn't have permission to visit her sisters and that she would be arrested for trespassing if she tried to enter. A couple of weeks later, and by this time the very worst of the abuse was happening, Diana met Jenny in a park. Jenny simply said that she wasn't allowed to speak to her and ran away. It would later be revealed that Gertrude had told Jenny that she would join her sister naked in the basement if she spoke to anyone about what was happening. Concerned, Diana called social services and they visited the Banishevsky house to check on Sylvia. Gertrude informed them that Sylvia had been kicked out of the house for being a prostitute and so no further action was taken. On another occasion, a boy named Michael Munro phoned in an anonymous report to his high school saying that there was a girl covered in open sores living in the Banashevsky house. The school sent a nurse round to check it out, but they were sent away with the same story, that Sylvia had been kicked out of the house for being a prostitute. Again, no further action was taken. Towards the end of October, after weeks of starvation and torture in the basement, Sylvia was brought upstairs and tied to the bed. Gertrude told her that she could live upstairs with the rest of the family if she could make it through one night without wetting the bed. By this time, Sylvia was completely incontinent. The next morning, when Gertrude found that Sylvia had wet the bed, she was beaten, then forced to do another striptease and masturbate with a coke bottle in front of the family. Then she was thrown back into the cellar. Later that day, Gertrude ordered that Sylvia once again be brought out of the basement and tied down in the kitchen. 
Gertrude walked into the kitchen with a large sewing needle. She said, You've branded my daughters, so I will brand you. With a lit match, she heated the sewing needle until it glowed red, then slowly carved the letters I and M into Sylvia's belly. She then passed the needle to Richard Hobbs and told him to continue the carving. Sylvia would have the phrase, I'm a prostitute and proud of it, burned into her flesh. Gertrude even wrote it down on a piece of paper so Hobbs could get the spelling right. With the branding completed, Gertrude left the house to fetch some groceries. Richard, Paula and Shirley took Sylvia back down to the basement and tied her to the stair rail. Evidently not satisfied with the abuse they'd already dished out, they decided Sylvia needed another brand, a large S on her chest. This stood for either Slave or Sylvia. Later during questioning they couldn't really decide which. They got a large metal hook and heated it with a match till it was hot enough to melt flesh. Richard burned the bottom half of the S into her chest, then ordered 10-year-old Shirley to finish it off. For some reason she messed up the top half of the S, drawing it backwards and turning it into a number 3. I believe this was the tool that they used. As you can see the hooked end matches the markings on her chest. After her branding, Coy Hubbard came down to the basement and practiced his judo throws on Sylvia, flipping her broken body against the hard floor until he grew tired. Later that night, Jenny snuck down into the cellar to comfort her sister. Sylvia said to her, Jenny, I know you don't want me to die, but I'm going to die, I can tell it. At this point she was experiencing severe malnutrition and her body was covered in open infected sores. She also had many internal injuries from the endless beatings. Whether she said this because she felt that her body was dying or because she felt that Gertrude planned to kill her is unknown. As it turns out, both were true. That night Gertrude brought Sylvia up from the basement and allowed her to sleep in a bed. The next day she and Stephanie gave Sylvia a bath. This time though it was a normal warm bath and they used gentle soap instead of scouring her body with salt. After the bath she was allowed to dress and then Gertrude gave her a piece of paper and a pen and told her to write a letter. The letter read Dear Mr. and Mrs. Likens, I went with a gang of boys in the middle of the night and they said they would pay me if I would give them something. So I got in the car and they got all they wanted. And when they got finished, they beat me up and left sores on my face and all over my body. They also put on my stomach, I'm a prostitute and proud of it. I have done just about everything that I could do just to make Gertie mad and cause Gertie more money than she's got. I've tore up a new mattress and peed on it. I have also cost Gertie doctor bills that she really can't pay and made Gertie a nervous wreck and all her kids. The picture I've got of this letter is a really low resolution image. You can't really make out the individual words, but I'm struck by how neat the writing is, given that this was written by a girl on the verge of death after months of abuse. With this letter written, Gertrude privately hatched a plan with the other children. John Jr. and Jenny were to take Sylvia to a dumping ground called Jimmy's Forest and leave her there to die. Sylvia overheard the plan and, realising that this was her last chance, she made a desperate attempt to escape. By this point she was so injured and weak that she barely managed to hobble to the front door before being captured. Sylvia was given some toast to eat but she was so dehydrated that she couldn't swallow any food. 
In retaliation for not eating, Gertrude beat her in the mouth with a metal curtain pole, then threw her back into the cellar. Later on, they attempted to feed her some crackers. Again, she refused and was beaten in the stomach as punishment. The next day, Gertrude came into the cellar to deliver another beating. By the sounds of it, she must have been in some kind of frenzy. She attempted to beat Sylvia with a chair and instead hit the wall, breaking the chair into pieces. Next, she tried hitting Sylvia with the paddle and instead she hit herself in the face, giving herself a black eye. Coy Hubbard had to step in and he beat Sylvia unconscious with a broomstick. That night, sensing her own imminent death, Sylvia tried to alert the neighbours by beating the cellar floor with a shovel and screaming for help. Although neighbours did hear the commotion going on till 3am, they didn't think to call the police. The following morning, Sylvia was in a completely incoherent state. She was possibly suffering from some sort of brain damage because she was unable to coordinate her body movements or string a sentence together. When Paula asked her to recite the alphabet, she was unable to get past the first few letters. By the afternoon, most of the household and a few neighbourhood kids had gathered in the basement to witness the dying girl. Sylvia lay on the floor, moving her arms in a strange, wavering fashion, as if trying to point to each of them. She would move her hands towards one of them and say, You're Ricky, and then point to another and say, You're Gertie. It was as if her dying brain was trying to remember the names of her attackers. She tried to eat a rotten pear from the floor, but complained that she could feel her teeth wobbling in her head. Later that evening, a hose was brought into the basement and Sylvia was blasted with cold water. She made one last attempt to escape, but was only able to crawl to the foot of the stairs. Gertrude stamped on Sylvia's head as punishment. Around 5.30pm, Stephanie Banaszewski and Richard Hobbs took Sylvia upstairs and gave her a warm bath. They then dressed her and laid her on the floor. Sylvia mumbled that she wished her daddy was there and asked Stephanie to take her home. A few moments later, she was dead. Stephanie attempted to give her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but it was too late by that point. Gertrude didn't realise that she was actually dead at first and spent several moments beating her lifeless body with a book and shouting, Faker, Faker. When it finally dawned on her that Sylvia wasn't faking, she dumped her corpse on a filthy mattress in one of the bedrooms and got Richard Hobbs to call the police. She then instructed the household on what to tell the police. When the police arrived, she told them that Sylvia had run away with some teenage boys, then returned to the house in that state. She showed them the handwritten note that she'd forced Sylvia to write. As instructed, the family confirmed this version of events. That is, until they questioned Jenny. She began telling them the rehearsed story, but as soon as Gertrude was out of earshot, she whispered to the officers, you get me out of here, and I'll tell you everything. An autopsy of Sylvia's body revealed the extent of the abuse. She had over 150 injuries in various states of repair. This showed that they'd been inflicted over an extended period of time. There were multiple burns and puncture wounds, severe bruising plus nerve and muscle damage. She was emaciated and dehydrated. All of her fingernails were broken backwards and she had bitten through her own lips in response to the pain. The constant scalding baths and the salt scrubs had left large sections of the skin on her face, breasts 
neck and legs peeling off. The infected open sores meant that her body had started to go into shock at least three days before she died. The ultimate cause of death was a subdural hematoma caused by a traumatic brain injury after a blow to the temple. Her body being in shock and the severe malnutrition were also contributing factors. Although many people took part in Sylvia's ordeal, five people were found to have inflicted the injuries that ultimately caused her death. Gertrude Banaszewski and her children Paula and John Jr., plus neighbourhood kids Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard. At the trial, Gertrude was found guilty of first-degree murder and was given life imprisonment. Paula was found guilty of second-degree murder. She would spend six years in prison before being released. John Jr., Richard Hobbs and Coy Hubbard were found guilty of manslaughter. Each of them were imprisoned for less than two years. In prison, Gertrude became a model prisoner. She was granted parole in 1985. After her release, she refused to acknowledge her role in Sylvia's death, stating that her asthma medication had affected her behaviour at the time and she couldn't remember inflicting any of the abuse. She preferred to blame Paula and John Jr. for most of it. She died of lung cancer five years after her release. Jenny Likens grew up to have a family of her own, although she was left psychologically damaged by the death of her sister. She needed to be on anxiety medication for the rest of her life. She died of a heart attack in 2004. The death of Sylvia Likens remains one of the most horrifying cases of child abuse in recent history. It's all the more shocking because of the number of people involved. The fact that so many people could be convinced to take part in the slow torture and murder of an innocent girl, it makes for a very disturbing psychological case study. These weren't psychopaths, they weren't brainwashed, these were classmates and family members that were slowly convinced into committing the worst acts imaginable. It was a gradual descent into a collective madness. It shows the kind of terrible things that ordinary people are capable of when acting in a group. By the end, I doubt they even thought of Sylvia as a fellow human being at all. Thank you for watching the video and I appreciate you sticking with it till the end. I've wanted to cover this case for a while but it was one of them things that there were so many other people covering it I figured it wasn't worth me making a video on it as well but as I got so many requests I guess there are people still interested in hearing about it so there you go. Anyway huge thanks as always to everyone supporting the channel on Patreon and Paypal. It means I can cover things like this in proper detail so thanks everyone. If you're new here then check out my channel. I don't really have a schedule but I make stuff like this on a fairly regular basis and you might find some other content worth watching too. So thanks once again for watching. Until next time, goodbye.